we hit the 100th mark, we can start. Okay. So welcome again to our Zoom conversation. We are delighted to have all of you here. We are recording this event and we will upload it to our website and please keep your microphone on mute. I am Daniela osatsky stern and this is our fifth virtual meeting. Our meetings has become well known and appreciated by scholars from around the world. And we thank you for your participation and positive feedback. The Holocaust Studies program at Western Galilee College, headed by Dr. Boaz Cohen, sees great need for our community of Holocaust scholars to join forces, especially nowadays in the challenging times of the pandemic. And so we prepared for you a unique opportunity for social networking. Since we are not able to meet in person in conferences and workshops as we used to, our next meeting on August 26 will be in a different form. We will give ourselves the opportunity to get to know each other better and to learn what are the latest researches in our field. I will let Dr. Cohen expand on it after the discussion, but please for now save the date August 26. So the Holocaust Studies Program is honored to host Professor Javi Dreyfus and Professor Gabriel Finder in our series of conversations with leading Holocaust scholars. Professor Dreyfus specializes in the history of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe and especially in Poland. She is a professor in the Department of Jewish History at the University of Tel Aviv, Israel, and head of the Center for Research on the Holocaust in Poland in the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem. Professor Dreyfus earned her PhD from the Hebrew University, and she was a student of the late respected Holocaust historian and survivor, Professor Israel Gutman. She is the author of numerous books and articles, among them, We Polish Jews, The Relations Between Jews and Poles During the Holocaust, and Warsaw Ghetto, The End. Professor Dreyfus is also a member of the advisory committee of the Holocaust Restitution Company of Israel, and the Advisory Committee of Research and Documentation for the Claims Conference. Her recent research deals with examining the religious life of Jews during the Holocaust. Today, she will speak about the Holocaust in Poland, challenges of research in current times. And I am very pleased to also introduce Professor Gabrielle Gabby Finder, our good friend, who is a professor in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures and in the Jewish Studies Program at the University of Virginia, who will lead the conversation. Professor Finder's interests are, among others, German and East European Jewish history and culture, Holocaust memory, post-Holocaust trials and relations between Jews and non-Jews in post-war Europe. He recently co-edited the book, Laughter After Laughter, Humor and the Holocaust. If you guys in the audience have any questions, please write them down on the chat. And afterwards, Dr. Ronnie Mikkel Ariely and Jan Bujlaf from our team, we'll read them. Javi and Gabi, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll begin. I want to thank my colleagues and friends at Western Galilee College, and first and foremost, my dear friend, old friend Boaz Cohen, 
for inviting me to participate in this important event. And it's an honor and privilege for me to have the opportunity to converse with Professor Javi Dreyfus, um, whom we, we've met a long time ago. We don't remember exactly under which circumstances. That's and uh, I'm a big fan of her work. And then um, because of this event, we became reacquainted again and we're already great friends. So it's an honor and a privilege um, to do this. So I'll begin. I'm going, we're going to, I'm going to be asking questions and we'll also be engaging in conversation. So, um, Professor Dreyfus, um, how did you become interested, first of all, in the academic study of the Holocaust? Well, first of all, Professor Finder, let's, let's start with the uh, first names. And thank okay. you. I, I want to thank you for taking the time and, and having this conversation as well to, as to our very good friends in the Western Galil College. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any dramatic, uh, interesting story about that. I, I am very lucky uh, for, for that, that four of my grandparents, all my grandparents were in Israel uh, during the Second World War. Three of them were in Israel with their families. So I'm not, uh, I didn't grow up in a family of uh, Holocaust survivors. But like, like many other young Israelis, I was very much engaged in Holocaust uh, literature and other things. And only after I got married, uh, it became also a family issue since my husband's uh, grandmother is a Auschwitz uh, survivor and then the, from Hungary, not from Poland, and then it became more personal. But uh, maybe the fact that it was a little bit more distance allowed me to deal with those uh, very, very difficult times. And uh, I came into it, I, I started doing, I started researching the Holocaust uh, uh, for a very weird reason. I finished my army service and wanted to go and be an educator. And my father, who is also here, uh, encouraged me to learn psychology and not education because you can always be an educator. And in Israel, you have to learn psychology with another field of interest. So I started to learn psychology and history of the Jewish people and very much found myself very much involved in Jewish history and especially in Holocaust studies. So it's not any unique story, but this is uh, what brought me to this field. Interesting, because so many of us who are in this field, especially people who are my age, uh, came to it because our parents are survivors. Uh, my parents are with us today here too. And uh, I think sometimes that I was destined from birth to be doing what I'm doing. But it's so interesting also to talk with people who don't have the same background and are still interested. So let me ask you this. You say that uh, your husband's grandmother is from Hungary. How did you become interested in Poland? Why is your focus Poland? And then I wanted to ask you, in addition to that question, in the same spirit, what, what ramifications uh, do our understanding of the Holocaust in Poland have for our general understanding of the Holocaust, in your view? Yes, so, so when I started studying about the Holocaust, I was interested in Poland because th simply that was the place where most Holocaust victims came from. And I thought that if I want to do something meaningful, I need to learn more about their lives, which I did before learning about their death and understanding better this uh, big concentration of Jews, which became later victim of the Holocaust. And of course, I learned the languages that are relevant because you cannot learn to know the, the, these, uh, those people without learning their languages. But today I think I can say a little bit more and this refers to your second question. Because I think that today I can say that Poland and Polish Jews, Poland is not only the central, it p plays a central place in the history of the Holocaust, not only because of the number of the Jews, and not only because uh, the fact that the, the, that the death camps were situated in Poland. I think that today, as I learn more and more about Poland and Polish Jewry during the Holocaust, I can say that there is almost, that you cannot almost find one important field within the Holocaust research that Poland doesn't have a great contribution to its understanding. It could be ideology, and we all know that ideology played a central role in the occupation of Poland, as well as later on the big struggle against uh, uh, Soviet Russia 
And there are many things that you can learn uh, focusing on this aspect from Poland on the larger picture. Uh, the beginning of, uh, of the mass uh, murder of the Jews, not only in the shooting pits, but also the development of what is called the, the final solution. Focusing on Poland, I think that there are many much la larger understandings. And of course, many other questions about uh, uh, relations between Jews and their surroundings. And in Poland, it's not only the Polish population, but also Ukrainians and Belarusians and Lithuanians and others. Question about Jewish resistance, questions about uh, local uh, undergrounds and the Jews. So I think that today, when I know more about uh, Polish Jewry during the Holocaust, there is almost, you cannot find any segment of the big history of the Holocaust, which focusing on the life and death of Polish Jews cannot contribute to our larger understandings. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with you. So I'd like to spend some time with you discussing your recent book, and I'll just hold it up for those who've never seen it before. There it is, um, published in Hebrew in 2017, uh, Ghetto Varsha, Hasov, April 1942, Juni 1943, that is uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, the end, April 1942 to Ju June 1943. Um, we both know, and almost everyone here knows, that the Warsaw Ghetto and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising are the subject of countless books and articles. And so I wanted to ask you, what new aspect or angle did you hope or aspire to address in your recent book? Yes, so, of course, Gabi, you are right, and there is a lot of research written on the Warsaw Ghetto. You yourself referred to it and many others as well. Uh, but when I was uh, reading wartime accounts, and this is mostly what I do, it could be diaries or wartime memories and other things, I got the feeling that uh, much was written about the Warsaw Ghetto until the summer of 1942. And we know quite a lot about daily life and family life and uh, economics and, and underground and youth movements and many other segments of the daily life. But suddenly when we come to this uh, breaking point of the great deportation, which happened in, from July to September 1942, we stopped talking about those issues, about the daily life of those Jews, about what happened to them during those uh, horrible days. And we talk about one of two subjects, or about the fact that they were killed in Treblinka, and we moved to Treblinka, or we talk about the uprising, which of course is very, very important, but today I can say very clearly that it's not only those uh, armed resistant groups, but many other Jews. And when I was looking at the, uh, reading those documents, I started asking myself, because even if we take the largest number that were ever stated regarding those undergrounds, we're talking about a few hundreds, maybe a little bit more than a thousand Jews who were fighting during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there were about 50,000 Jews still living in the ghetto. And one of the things that I was interested in is trying to understand how did they live? Mm -hmm. How did they live until those days of the uprising and during the uprising itself? And I, 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 you're right that the book was not published yet in English. Hopefully it will be uh, translated. But but reading, reading those sources, I came to, to find this society that time after time finds itself in a great turmoil and has to redefine exactly what they are as a community and as private people. I'll, I'll give you just one example and, and uh, just to show how things change so dramatically at the Warsaw uh, Ghetto. One second, I just want to make sure that I could point out what is needed. And this is just one example. Those are the numbers of the ghetto population before and after the Great Deportation. It's written as Hebrew, so I apologize, although it should be in English. And we can see the men and women, women in red, men in blue, uh, before the Great Deportation and after, and according to age, until the age of nine, 10 to 19, and so on. And we can see that before the Great Deportation, there were about 50,000 children, boys and girls, until the age of nine years old. And there were about 70,000 youngsters until the age of 19. After the Great Deportation, there were 253 children until the age of three, and about 2,500 
until the age of 19. Now, the whole society changed with this big stroke. And it also changed because before the Great Deportation, you can see that there were much more women than men. And after the Great Deportation, there were more men than women. But even more than that, the Great Deportation in the Warsaw Ghetto is something that takes two months. And that is day after day after day. And I wanted to see what happened to the community as private people and as a society in those days. And I'll just, just give one example, a visual example. This is a very well-known picture of Yitzhak Katzenelson. Uh, this is a picture before the war with two of his youngest children, which were later on in this great deportation, uh, taken to Treblinka and murdered. This picture is a picture taken a little bit more than four years after the first one. And this is again, it's Hakatsa Nelson with his oldest son, Svi. So looking at those pictures and reading those documents, I felt that many times we don't understand clearly enough what happened to the Jewish community in those days, during the Great Deportation, after the Great Deportation, and even during the uprising itself. Mm -hmm. So this was the first uh, motive to research it, and I found it very, very interesting and, of course, uh, heartbreaking because those were dreadful days. I think that your approach is very important. I think that you've ex um, uncovered an unexplored aspect of a subject that has been written about so much. Let me ask you, though, Javi, what is your argument? What argument are you trying to make in your book, especially about the average people who were not part of uh, the underground movement, not part of the Jewish fighting organization, for example. Okay, so actually they were my main focus. Uh, when I started writing, I said, I, do, I don't want to talk about those uh, uprising groups because so much was written about them. Uh, and I was most interested in those people trying to understand their fears, their hopes, their delusions, and I think that uh, there are a few things that can be said. First of all, uh, knowing better the Great Deportation, one can see how brutal those actions were. Many times we talk about, you know, the Great Deportation, more than 300,000 Jews were sent to Treblinka, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's all. But the way those deportations were done uh, were so brutal and brought the Jews to the edge in so many means that it destroyed everything that existed before. Just one example, one of the important public spheres within the Warsaw Ghetto, and much was written about it, was the street. So many things happened in the street. Mm -hmm. And this thing just disappeared at once as soon as the Great Deportation starts. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we can see, and I will just point a few of my understandings uh, from this research, is that many times when we talk about the Holocaust and we talk about Jewish reactions, we talk about rescue or about revolt. That is a, a fight or flee, a flee or fight. But when we read wartime accounts, we see that freeze, something that is lately being discussed so much, was also so apparent within the ghetto. Uh, Facing this brutality, these this murderous acts, many people just could not react. And another thing that you can see reading their accounts is that when the Great Deportation ended, this is only the first time that Jews can really try to understand what happened to them until then. But they live in a totally different sphere. And it, first of all, they are divided. And again, I'll just use one, one uh, image to show that the, the, the Warsaw Ghetto a map after the Great Deportation is, of course, completely different because all the uh, small ghetto, all the northern part was given back to the Polish side. That is important because it has a great impact on what Jews thought will happen to them later. And in the ghetto, the Jews were held in one of the four segments that you, we can see here, the central ghetto, the Bushmaker's shop, which, which is, of course, is a, fair, a place where uh, uh, those Jews had to work in those uh, uh, different shops, and uh, an area where the, there's, uh, were many other uh, factories which uh, the Jews were first to work within this area. Now, it doesn't have any resemblance to what happened in the ghetto before because people live in a specific house and are taken as a group 
to the place where they work and then taken back. Uh, in the ghetto, there are about 36,000 Jews who have a permit, uh, are permitted to stay in the ghetto, but especially in the central ghetto, we have many wild Jews. This is how they are called. And we have Jews who are working not only in the shops, in the factories within the ghetto, but also in platzufkas, that is working places outside of the ghetto. And very soon we have different things that is happening in each one of those places. What is common to all of them is their understanding, which today we know is not accurate, but this is, was their understanding that the Germans uh, will kill anybody, everybody and that all of the Jews that are being deported from Warsaw Ghetto are being sent to death. Now these understandings, it takes for them time to, 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 to uh, establish it. But even when the Nazis, Nazi Germany is trying to transport those shops and those platzovka, especially the shops, to the Lublin concentration camps, the Jews will not believe that. And for them, every train that leaves the Warsaw Ghetto is, of course, on its way to Treblinka. Now, this is very, very important because when the Germans will try to move those Jews to the Lublin concentration camps, the Jews will not believe that. They will believe that, and we're talking now on January 1943, January 1943, although the Stalingrad uh, battle was not ended yet, people understand that Germany has many problems and there are much more uh, bombing of the Russians in the area of Warsaw. And in many different wartime accounts, you can find people saying, it's only a question of a half a year. Half a year and the Russian will be here. So we have to survive six more months. And we know what will happen. The Germans will try to deport us all to Treblinka and they will give up back those streets to the Polish society. So we have to hide within this area until in six months the Russians will come. This is what stands behind those Jews who are hiding in bunkers. And this is another thing. Um, I found very interesting things, I think, about what was once called the small uh, uh, uprising or the uh, general uprising. Jews didn't call it an uprising, they called it the second action. The first one was a great deportation, and they thought that this was a second one. So one of the things is that when you're reading those accounts, you can see that time after, after time, Jews are explaining the present according to the past, even if, some, even if something completely different heads them. And you can see that during the uprising itself as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I found so interesting uh, in your argument and in your narrative is that it seems that uh, the objectives of the armed Jewish underground and of the majority of people were different. Um, when I think about the underground, I think uh, that the objective at the end, especially in April and May 1943, was to fight for Jewish honor, to fight for dignity, uh, without really the thought that they would survive. Whereas when I read your book, it seems to me that the objective of the thousands of Jews, ordinary Jews, was to try to continue to survive a bit longer. So you have two groups um, resisting, each in their own way, yet they create some sort of special synergy that creates a mass revolt, but with groups of different objectives. Am I right? And maybe you could elaborate. Yes, of course you are right. And I think the important thing that you just said is that all of them resist in a way that they, the, the way that they understand the reality and the future, but they resist in a different way. The armed resistant groups, and of course both of them has their own uh, different uh, ways they see the things. Uh, the job, that is of uh, Mordechai Nilevich, they don't think that they will survive. And they want to die in the ghetto. And they think that what the Germans will do is just deport group after group, so they will just shoot them from different corners. And of course, this will not, is not what will happen. But this is what they want, and they are resisting Nazi Germany, hoping to die, as you said, for the honor of the Jewish people. The Jejevu, the revisionistic group, is a little bit different because they have some military, military experience and they understand they cannot fight for a few long time in the ghetto. So they want to make their point fighting in the ghetto and then go to the forest and continue to fight the Germans as part of the partisans. So again, they are fighting the German in a different way. But the most interesting group, and I agree with you that this is this synergy that uh, occurs in the ghetto, are those Jews 
who decide to resist any order of the Germans of leaving Warsaw. Now, the Germans are, are trying to convince, especially the Jews who are working in shops and in other places, that they will be transferred to Lublin, which of course happened, and later on, those Jews in Lublin will be killed as part of the Antifist. They will not survive for long afterwards. But the Germans are trying to do all they can to move those Jews to Lublin. And those Jews, most of the, of the Jews who are still in the Warsaw Ghetto, resist those German orders and decide to stay in Warsaw, hoping that they will survive. But even when the houses are burning just above them and the houses are collapsing on their heads, they still don't believe any of the Germans and they will stay in the Warsaw Ghetto and bury in the Warsaw Ghetto under those burning houses and not obey the Nazis' orders. So as you said, they have different goals, but all of them are united in this resistance to Nazi Germany. So was there a relationship between the underground, between the commenda, you know, the leadership of uh, both uh, Jewish underground organizations and people, the general population in the ghetto? Was there any kind of communication or relationship with them? Or were they working in separate, uh, on separate paths, for example? So, so this is very interesting because for a long time we were reading mainly the accounts and mainly later accounts of uh, people who were part of those uh, armed resistance groups and especially, of course, the Job. And they saw themselves really as people who uh, symbolized what the ghetto wanted and were in contact with the ghetto and so on. But, you know, you cannot talk about an underground that everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. And this is something very interesting because most of the Jews, first of all, they didn't know about all those political fights that we wrote so much about the job and the jejevu and the fighting between them. Some of them even didn't know there was these kind of groups. There were some, some Jews who bought weapons, not because they thought that they will fight Nazi Germany, but if you hide in what once was the Warsaw Ghetto and those streets are being returned to the Polish society, so you better have, you know, this pistol to frighten anybody that will try to expose you. So there were other people who were fighting. It wasn't that Mordechai Nilevich or Pavel Frenkel stood up in the middle of the ghetto and told the Jews, listen, you have to do this or that. It wasn't this kind of a relationship. The underground felt that they have this discussion with the ghetto, but it doesn't mean that all of the ghetto recognized them. Mm -hmm. Well, actually what is very interesting is that when one of the pe person that became very influential in the Warsaw ghetto is of course Tebens, who for different reasons gets the responsibility to pass the Jews to the Lublin area. And when he starts to communicate and refer to different uh, 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 publications of the underground saying, you know, the underground is telling you to stay here, do not to believe the Germans, I can guarantee everything will be okay. The fact that a German high uh, uh, ranking official is of course, he's not an SS man, he's a private person, an industrial, but the fact that he's referring to those underground groups give them much more, I will say, appearance than before. But in many places, people even didn't know about these organizations. So I, coming to the question of resistance, I noticed in reading your book that you rarely use the term Amidah in Hebrew, which has also been adopted by scholars in other languages. The Hebrew word Amidah, which means to stand, and it's used in the context of standing up against the Germans uh, in ways that are not part of the armed resistance. Why don't you use the term Amidah? Do you see a distinction between Amidah and what the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were doing by hiding in bunkers, by trying to survive? What is the distinction? Why do you seem to use the term very sparingly? Yes. So, of course, Amidah is a very important term, and it was developed and termed after the problem that we as scholars had with all this question of resistance, because in the big beginning we were talking about armed resistance and talking mainly about partisans and uprising in ghettos. And then we got to the understanding that there were other kinds of resistance as well, passive resistance, but passive resistance sounds very bad. And then we were starting to talk about Amida. 
Now, Amida is like a, this general term to all of the things that were many, many, very meaningful and very important, but are not armed resistance. It could be education. It could be Janusz Korczak working with his kids. Uh, it could be people uh, keeping their religion. So it's a very, very general term to all of those things that we know are very, very important, but aren't really armed resistance. Now, what I was asking, I was trying to ask a little bit a, a different set of questions, which you already mentioned. And that is to ask, what were the res Jews resisting to? What exactly did they understand about Nazi Germany and their plans towards the Jews? They could be right or wrong. And what did they do if they did anything to resist it? And I think that when you ask those questions, you can find some resistance to Nazi ideology that is attempt to preserve a human or Jewish spirit or human and Jewish values that could be solidarity or justice or morality in many different tools of education and culture and more. And this can be done by Jews or non-Jews. So that is resisting to Nazi ideology. Another kind of resistance is a resistance to the act of extermination. And that could be rescue. It could be attempts to preserve life. It, it could be attempts to harm the anti-Jewish activity, but that is a different kind of, of a, a resistance. And I think that if we are asking those questions, we can find a very long spectrum that goes from disobedience to active moral or psychological survival, to amida, to revolt, to uprising of masses. And the questions that we should ask are a little bit different. I mean, it could be an act of resistance to Nazi ideology or to Nazi attempt to exterminate all the Jews done by Jews or non-Jews. Uh, it could be something that was planned. It could be something that was not really planned. It was something that uh, could be uh, unique or, or could be common to more larger groups. So I think that Amida is a very important concept, but trying to understand better Jewish activity and inactivity in those days, as well as a wider picture, demands another additional set of questions, which that is what I was trying to do in this book. So in your book, you use a lot of images. A lot of them come from the album, the infamous album of uh, SS uh, General Jürgen Stroop, who uh, was responsible for the final brutal liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto and the suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Um, of course, many of the pictures or images in your book were taken, those were photos that were actually taken by Germans, which present uh, specific problems for researchers who use them. I wonder if you could uh, discuss uh, some of the images in your book. Um, what can we learn from images? What did you learn? How did they help you understand your subject? And what kinds of methodological um, things did you have to keep in mind when you decided which photos to use? Uh, in your book, and other images too, not just photos. No, th thank you, thank you, Gabby, and you, and you as well refer to those questions because I, I think that many times we historians uh, overlook uh, visual documentation, which are of course those photos as well as uh, footage and other visual documentation. And one of the things I was trying to do is to use the vast visual documentation we have about the Warsaw Ghetto. And we, we do have quite a lot. Now, you're of course right that uh, uh, much of this uh, documentation was taken by the Germans. And just as we need to read, uh, and, and I think that just as we need to read um, um, uh, textual sources, we also need to read those uh, uh, visual documentation. Yes, and of course, they pose many different challenges because as you said, they were taken by the Germans. So this is a German point of view and this is what they saw. On the other hand, we cannot overlook them because we don't have so much Jewish uh, point of view photos. Now, I tried to learn better those photos. And as you said, some of them are very well known. This is one of them. And here we can see a group of men and women and you can see this young child and they're taken out of one of the shops. I'll go one second back and you can see that uh, this, this map of course is from the wonderful book written by Professor Engel King and by uh, 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 Professor Leotschiak about the Warsaw Ghetto. 
The book is very important as well as the maps which are attached. And you can see that the shops in many places, the shops themselves had walls. So actually what you can see here is the Jews leaving one of those shops. And this is a group that was from the, uh, sh the shop area. And they are, they, they, they came out after the Nazis ordered on the, on the third day of the uprising. And they're taken as a group. And we actually, we can go and follow them throughout the street. And again, you can see this woman, you can see this child, and you can see this man. And they are walking throughout the burning street. And you can see how the, the sky become more and more darker because of the burning of what was left behind. But one of the interesting things is also what you can see here. This picture was taken actually exactly at the same place, but you can see that there are much more smoke and then you can see that there are much more wounds and you can see that those Jews are being guarded much more. Now, if you connect those pictures to the documentation that we have, we know that in the shops when the Jews were taken out, only a few, a, a very small uh, number of Jews uh, uh, came out when the Germans demanded. Most of the Jews just were hiding, although they had documentation that they are working in this or that German factory. Uh, and then the German gave an ultimatum and said that if the Jews will not uh, go out and, and go to the streets at six o'clock, they will be just killed as others. When this doesn't work, they give them in another ultimatum and they start burning houses. So actually what you can see in those pictures is really the, the different time before the, before the ultimatum and after the ultimatum. And those are Jews which are being taken after the second part, after, after the second ultimatum. So looking at those pictures and reading them carefully, one can learn a lot about what happened. On the other, but one can must say, also that it puts us, the researchers, in quite a, a, some challenging uh, spot. And I will give you just one example. The next photos I want to show you are not as well known and they're quite difficult and I'm not showing them as whole. Uh, I put them in this way because what you can see here is part of the things that many times we don't talk about discussing the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and that is that the Germans, when they caught those Jews, usually they forced them out, uh, searched body them, men and women, including forcing them to undress, men and women, and there was a lot of sexual and physical abuse at this time. And then usually they were just shot in the streets, uh, bodies burned in Zamenhof 19, and so on. Now, when I was doing my research in the very first stages, when I learned about this awful brutality by Germans, by Ukrainians, by others, I, was, I knew that I have to present those pictures. And especially the picture that you can see here, because you can see this Jewish woman forced to be undressed here. And you can see this man, this woman is all naked how he is searching her as well. And when we came to the really last uh, uh, discussions about the book, and I was just discussing this with my good friends at Yad Vashem, we, they, they, they pointed out the many problems we have in presenting this picture as it is. First of all, it's so horrible that people might just close the book and we go away. So one of the challenges that we have is how do we present those awful atrocities without pushing the people away? And on the one hand, we have to be very, very precise. But on the other hand, if we really tell the whole story, if we really so sh show the whole images, people can just go away. And I had many conversation and discussion and harsh discussion with friends about these photos. And at the bottom line, we didn't include it in the book. We didn't include it, it uh, for the very simple reason that all of us can make mistakes. And I was thinking that if I will do a mistake and include this photo in the book, um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge mistake. It's a huge mis mistake that could be, hardly could be corrected. Uh, on the other hand, if I will not present this difficult picture in the book, the, and it was a mistake, this is a mistake that can still be handled. And what I did in the book is that I described this picture and referred to it without presenting it as it is. So this is just one example for the problems that I felt I have with this 
uh, dealing with those time of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising because it's not only the fighting, it's really the brutalization and awful things that happened. And I just want to refer to two more examples of, or, or, or maybe three more short examples of visual documentation. And one of them was, of course, this famous picture that we all know, which was, of course, taken in the Warsaw Ghetto, and we all know that this is Josef Blocher, which appears in other pictures as well. But what is interesting, and this is of course connected to my current research, is that those Yiddish rabbis, which are being pictured here, are also known by name. This is Heschel Rappaport, and we know the other, many of the other Jews which are pictured here. And one of the question is, how come those Jews continue to keep their uh, traditional clothing as well as their beards and pearls until April 1943? Who were their Jews? What did they do until then? This is what I was trying to do in my book. And one more interesting thing is that many times, I, I, or at least a few times, I, I found that testimonies are not only uh, brought in a verbal way, but also by drawing. I mean, this person, Peretz Choshati, uh, didn't tell his testimony in words, but in drawing. So this is another kind of visual documentation as well as aerial photos that if you want, I can refer to later, but this is quite shortly referring to this very important question of yours. And I know that you deal with those pictures as well. So I know that you have much to say about it as well. I've been interested recently in the use by the Jews immediately after World War II and the Holocaust um, in the uh, dissemination of the photos to try to bring, to try to bring the horrors of the Holocaust to show out to a larger community, to, out, to make people feel moral outrage. Uh, and Jews had no choice but to use photos used by German, taken by Germans, because there weren't that many photos taken by Jews. Uh, and so yes, it's even, not only we historians, but survivors were also faced with this dilemma when they wanted to use visual materials after the war, which visual materials to use, how to use um, German uh, produced uh, photographs and images. Um, you know, I have to take a break now too and uh, inhale and exhale after seeing those uh, terrible photos. They really bring home uh, the horrific, um, brut brutal uh, nature of um, the uh, actions of the Germans in the Warsaw Ghetto. I found very interesting. If, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, Javier. No, I, I I, I apologize for, for that, and, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's the first time, although I talked a lot about the book, since this is a professional audience, it's the first time that I show the pictures as they are. And th this is really a basic question, because actually, I, I actually, even now, I didn't show the pictures as they are, because I put them one above the other, so the true hor horrific image could not be seen. But th this is a, a true dilemma that I feel that we still uh, have to struggle with. And that is, what do we do with those most awful testimonies? And I had it with written testimonies as well. I mean, part of the Warsaw Uprising is that buildings are just collapsing and people are buried alive and burned alive and so on. And I had few very uh, detailed description of that. And on the one hand, I knew that if I will include them in the books, people will not read the book. But on the other hand, if I omit them, this is not the true story. And I, I didn't know what I should do with it. And, and what I decided to do, and I'm not sure it's the best solution, but it's the only solution I, I got to at the bottom. Some friends said, well, you know, you can put it in an appendix. And then I said, you know, it will be an appendix of her things. Nobody will read them. It, it's really, it's, it's, it's almost a pornographic uh, d description of the Holocaust. What I did with the textual uh, uh, documentation is that I cited them with gaps. Whoever reads the text understands that something horrible happened. But I bring the whole text only in the footnotes. Now, some people say, well, you know, of course the eye goes back to the footnote to read the whole documentation. But it gives some kind of a barrier. On the other hand, I must admit it's a true challenge that I'm not sure I have the best solution to that one. I'm not sure that anyone has the best, that there is only one solution. I think that your solution was a good one. Um, it's very interesting to see those uh, photographs of um, Orthodox Jews. And I know that uh, your new research project deals with the life and experiences and uh, modes of resistance and death of Orthodox Jews 
in Poland during the Holocaust. And I was hoping that you would say something about your new project. If you could explain, I know that you've argued in some of your articles already on this topic that uh, the lives and deaths of Orthodox Jews during the Holocaust have been marginalized by researchers, by scholars. Uh, can you elaborate more on that and what you hope to do now in your research as you move forward with this project? Yes, so, so it, it's, it's a very big project and as I learn more and more, I understand that I will not be able to uh, depict the whole life of Orthodox Jewry during the Holocaust, but what I'm trying to do is to find few examples that can teach us, the scholars, how those issues were neglected and how incorporating them within the Holocaust research can give us all new points of view. And I'll give you a few examples. We, we have those orthodox references in a few specific places. First of all, in visual documentation. When we want to show somebody Jewish being harassed or humiliated by the Germans, we have to show that he's Jewish. We have few reference to specific rabbis, well, mostly well-known rabbis, uh, referring to leadership. But even if we'll take this question of leadership and, and rabbis, in almost each and every small community, there were a few rabbis. Most of the, those rabbis didn't have the opportunity to flee because if you are a community rabbi, you, you're, 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 you're dependent on the community and you cannot just flee and live as a rabbi and a more of a Hasidic group can do. So first of all, there are differences within those rabbis. But one of the interesting things that I found is that one of the questions we should ask ourselves is what did the Jews in that specific community expect, of, expect from their rabbis? Sometimes they expected him really to lead or to help the Judenrat or to support the Judenrat. Sometimes they just expected him to sit and study Torah because if he sits and study Torah, that protects the whole community. And if I cannot pray, it according to the Jewish law, because I have to leave very early to forced labor or anything else, the fact that the rabbis still have a minion, that is something that is protecting me as well. So if we're looking, for example, the question of rabbis and leadership, it gives us so many different understandings about leadership in general. A another example I can give is that for years I heard about these weird group many times discussed within ultra-orthodox uh, groups about this underground Hasidic group led by a man called Mati Gelman, the Matisich and Matisovichim, who were like some kind of an uh, Hasidic underground during the war. And I must admit that for years I thought this is something that is mainly a legend, something that we shouldn't really believe. And when I got into this issue, I found out that I and we were the problem because we didn't look into those Haredic documentation. And this person, Mati Gelman, uh, of course, lived uh, uh, before the war. He was very close to the Admo, to the uh, rabbi of Gu. And here you can see him pictured with Admo, which is quite unique. Most Hasidim didn't have this kind of picture. Uh, this Admo is important because before the war, as part of the, ch the challenges that his Hasidim had with all those different youth movements, secular youth, movement, youth movements, he established some kind of a orthodox youth movement of studying Torah. It's not really a youth movement, but those are uh, groups of young men who are studying together Torah and are very, very much connected to the rabbi. Now we can trace this Mati Gelman. We can see, we can find documents from his childhood. He was brought in a secular home. He fled a home and came to the Yeshiva of Chachmei Lublin. His father came and took him back and he fled from the train uh, with his friends from the Hasidut. And then he was forced to go back to his family. I didn't say he was born in Vienna. He's a Australian, Austrian Jews. He was born in Vienna and this is where he was uh, was brought and he left Vienna secretly to join this yeshiva. And then we can find him years later within this group of Hasidic uh, Gur who are studying and, and uh, he's not one of the name, names listed in this, uh, uh, this kvittel to the rabbi. 
And during the war, he becomes a very important figure that wanders from place to place and helps those young Hasidic group to continue and study Torah. And at the bottom line, of course, he's been caught by the Germans in April 1942, brought to Auschwitz. And the bottom line that you can see here is Matthias, this Matitiao Gelman, who was executed by the Germans on June 1942. So this is a story that I myself thought that is just a legend. And reading carefully uh, those orthodox documentation just showed me that the problem was with my research and not with what I thought about this group. Now, Elsa, I read your article on Gelman. I found so interesting his effort to make those Hasidic uh, groups of young people um, community groups, uh, socialist in a way. They shared their food together. They tried, they tried to erase distinctions between the wealthy and the poor. It was, they were creating not just a study group, it was a community of young Orthodox people, which I found fascinating. So this leads me to my next question for you, and that is a methodological question. Um, most, myself, most scholars, myself included, when we um, do our research on uh, people, Jews who lived during the Holocaust, we deal, most of us deal with people who were, they were religious, so many Jews had a religious background, but the methodological challenges of reading, let's say, a testimony of someone who we would even consider to be modern in outlook must be different from reading the testimony of someone who was a Hasidic Jew during the Holocaust. How do you deal with those are there methodological differences and how do you deal with them when you approach testimony of um, Orthodox or Hasidic Jews during the Holocaust? Yes, so, so this is another great question, Gabi. And of course, first of all, those, uh, those uh, documents, uh, I'm reading them as we read usually, uh, documents and testimonies given by Jews and that is always with a critical eye because Many times, and we all know it, that uh, survivors, not from any wrong uh, feelings or whatever, the description is what they remember and what they saw, and many times what they want to tell in the specific point of their life that they are giving this testimony. And this is true for those testimonies as well. But it also has some unique language that uh, one has to learn to understand of what is said and what is not said and how things are being said. And uh, I'll give just one example that I cite many times and that is an example of the writings of Rabbi uh, Avigdo. And he was a rabbi before the war in the area of uh, uh, Dohovitz and uh, uh, during the war and, and after the war he writes two books. Right after the end of the Second World War in the 50s, in the early 50s, uh, uh, 49 actually, in 50, he writes two books. And in those books, he described what happened during the war. And in one of them, he said that uh, um, th they came to, to me, to my bed, to my uh, rabbinical court, and asked uh, if uh, Jews can flee to the Christian uh, uh, surroundings. And this was a very difficult question from the rabbinical point of view because according to the Jewish law, there are three uh, things that one should sacrifice his, his life and not uh, pass over those mitzvot, yarek v'bal yavo. And one of them is avodah uh, zorah, and that is uh, acting as a Christian uh, person. I won't refer you to all the halachic arguments. So this was a problem because purely halachic speaking, rabbinical law speaking, this is something that we could not allow and that was very difficult and he goes on to give the description uh, of other things that occurred. And he doesn't say anything about what happened to those questions forward to them. But then he has, in the second book, he says something like that. He says, um, uh, because of the mass murder that was happening, and many people came to us and asked us if they can flee, especially young women. From the rabbinical point of view, there is a difference if those are unmarried young women. And we had to, we had a very long discussion about it. Me and my rabbinical court, we sat the whole night and I cannot tell you what we decided. And it goes on. Now, I cannot say what, we decided this is something that for sure they gave the halachic permission to do something that in any other reality during the course of years of the Jewish religion 
This is something that was always uh, seen as contradict to the most fundamental understandings. Now, he cannot spell it out, but it's very clear from reading what he said and what he didn't say, as well as other things. Uh, only lately, I started to be a little bit more uh, sensitive to a very big question that Orthodox Jews had during the years of the war, especially in places where they were very, very crowded. And that is the problem of men and women in the same house. Mm -hmm. I found this letter from Warsaw Ghetto, somebody saying that, you know, we now pushed in the ghetto, so many people in the same apartment, and we could not live this way. So we divided the house to two and there is a part of men and a part of women. And I feel that I don't have any more my home. I don't have a house and I all the time flee to the streets. And now I'm starting to read those accounts more carefully because this is something that you don't speak about, Yehud and men and women. But this was something that was a true problem for Orthodox people. And it was part of their life and their challenges in those days. So I'm trying to be careful. For sure, I'm missing things for both way, but it also enables me to ask different questions and develop different understandings, not only the, according to the Orthodox community, but other, ho I hope, other communities as well. So I know that many people want to ask you questions. Let me finish with one, I had more, but let me finish with one, and then we'll open the floor to questions from uh, the participants. Uh, you've been, um, I think it's fair to say an outspoken critic of the historiographical approach and uh, public approach to the Holocaust in Poland and to representations or misrepresentations of the Holocaust in Poland. And I would like you to explain your position on the way that the Holocaust is approached in Poland today. Well, I, I, I think I, I re, re, will rephrase that because I am very, very critical to attempts and unfortunately even successes of the current Polish government to influence the historical discourse and to distort the representation of the Holocaust. There is no, uh, no problem or there is no uh, critical approach to Polish scholars or to what is happening in Poland in general. Poland has wonderful scholars and actually the most important research written in the last few decades were written by Polish scholars. So the problem is not Polish or Israeli, Jewish or whatever, but there is a great difference between people who are committed to the history, to the research, to the documentation, and to those who want to use those uh, documentation in order to distort what is known. Unfortunately, the current Polish government is putting all its uh, effort to do that, and that place mainly my dear colleagues and friends in Poland in great problems. I mean, I can write whatever I want to write, and uh, I can do whatever I want to do, and I have wonderful students that none of them are being frightened to seek and find what they can really uh, understand from the sources. Unfortunately, my wonderful colleagues in Poland are not in the same situation. And this is what I and my friends from many other places, from Yad Vashem and from many other places are critical. And I just wish our all that, uh, all of us, that those wonderful scholars from Poland and from other places will be able to continue to do their wonderful work because we all benefit from their understanding and research. Agree. Well, thank you, Javi. I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I think that I'll now hand the floor over to our friends from Western Galilee College, and uh, there are many questions for you, I'm sure. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you, Javi, so much uh, for a fascinating talk, and thank you, thank you Gabriel, for hosting uh, the conversation. Uh, we have many questions, but I want to keep us uh, still in the political sensitive issue of the Polish government and to ask you what we as scholars, as Holocaust researchers can do to support our colleagues in, uh, in Poland now in this difficult time? Well, first of all, this is something that should be addressed to them. And I never speak in their names. And those who want to understand more can watch the, uh, the, the lecture that was just given in the beginning of the week by Professor Jan Grabowski at Lochomea Getaot. 
and generally speaking, I will say two things. First of all, what we can do is continue to do our work and continue to see uh, the, to see this whole story from the professional point of view and to read carefully what is uh, scholarly writings and what are political writings. And I'll give just one example. Um, the, the EPN, the National uh, Remembrance Institu Institution in Poland that for years was an important institution uh, in charge of documentation and other things as well. Uh, due to the change of the law that happened in the summer of, of 2018, today part of its, actually the first of its obligation is to protect the good name of Poland. So this institute who has a lot of money and a lot of power is publishing pseudo-academic things. I'm saying pseudo-academic because by law, they are committed not to the research and not to the documentation, but to the protection of the good name of Poland. So I think that what we can do is to be very careful when we read things and to see if those are scholarly writings and they're wonderful scholarly writings by Polish scholars or those are political writings. That is one thing. Uh, another thing is that, and that is a great problem, is that many times I fear, and I don't have a good answer to your wonderful question, Ronnie. I fear that things that we might say in order to support them can even harm them. So this is tricky times, and I really think that we should be very sensitive to that, and things are changing in Poland from time to time, unfortunately, mainly to the worse, but we have to be very sensitive to that. Thank you so much. Jan? Uh, thanks, thanks to both for a fascinating talk and uh, conversation. We have a question from our friend Boas, who asks um, about uh, children. And his question is, I find the data about the children very important. What percentage of the Jews in the Great Deportation Wave were children and teenagers, and were the Germans, second uh, part of the question, specifically targeting Jewish children? Uh, okay, so thank you, Boaz. This is, of course, a great question. Um, I'll go back to my presentation. Now, of course, uh, during the Great Deportation, the Great Deportation in the Warsaw Ghetto is part of a, of a sorry, uh, I, go, I went back to the wrong, uh, uh, okay, here it is. Uh, the Great Deportation, of course, was part of the act, uh, Reinhold Aktion, uh, in, in, and part of the Reinhold Aktion is the mass murder of all the Jews, uh, and those who are working are the exception, but of course children are not considered as working, and this is why children are being sent as they are. The Jews who are getting the permission to stay in the ghetto are the Jews who are working in one of those shops or platzovkos or uh, the Veterfassung. Uh, but other Jews, all of them are being sent. And among them, of course, all the children. So I cannot say that children were specifically targeted because all the Jews were targeted, especially except those who were kept for because for working for the Germans. But you can see that 90%, over 90% of the children disappeared during the Great Deportation. There weren't any children anymore in the ghetto. Actually, there weren't any old people as well. And of course, you're right, boys, that this changed dramatically the whole life of the Jews, uh, the, the way that they saw themselves. A, a question that is connected to that is, uh, is the fact that we have less women after the Great Deportation is because women went with the children or not, more than men. So we don't know that, and of course we know that the Germans many times gave the permission to work more to, to men than to women, but we have countless uh, testimonies of uh, women, men as well, but mainly women, who decided to go with the children if, even if they had the documentation and thought that they could stay. So I would not say that the German targets, especially the Jews, because this is a final solution. They are tar they're targeting all the Jews and not only ch the children. But as Itzhak Atzenelson said in his well-known poem about the Jewish people that was 
uh, murdered, many times the children were the first victims. Thank you, Javi. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, your methodology during this conversation. Uh, and, and still we have a question that I'm also personally relating to. Uh, and I think it's, it's between the, the, the tension between the, uh, the macro history and, and micro history. And how can we as historians who uh, deal with personal narratives, diaries, oral history, testimonies, autobiographies, as uh, uh, Ximena Vanessa asked, uh, how can we uh, uh, address those personal uh, narratives uh, as part of the, you know, master narrative of the Holocaust or, or as part of the macro history? Uh, yes, so I think this is a challenge that we all researchers face all the times and that is how do we give the picture of the woods and the forest at the same time. And I don't have any format, but what I was trying to do in this research, as well as in other places, is trying to give a kaleidoscope of stories and faces that give the impact of uh, what was the main story or the, or the main thing that happened. And from time to time, doing zoom out and zoom in. But this is part of the challenges that we all find ourselves. I'll give an example with the rabbis. I mean, many times when research is being written about uh, rabbinical leadership during the Holocaust, people focus on those very famous rabbis who fled the, the Nazi occupation, the Gur rabbi and others. But there were literally thousands of Polish rabbis who stayed in occupied Poland. Now, I cannot refer to each and every one of them. And this is also always uh, quite uh, heartbreaking because people are looking for their story and looking for their grandparents' story and so on. But what I'm trying to do is give enough examples that uh, will not uh, focus us again in the very well-known few voices but elaborate a little bit the picture. At the, world, at the same time, we cannot uh, give an, some kind of an encyclopedic uh, version of the issue because people want to read a story with a general narrative. So it's, as you said, playing all the time between micro and macro and trying to tell a story that gives, that have more general, uh, um, connections and contexts. Um, I had a question about the photographs and, and particularly the, in the same vein about the methodological challenges. Um, I'm currently looking at some um, photographs of the wave of this communal violence, program violence in the summer of 1941. And I was wondering how did you go about uh, identifying these individuals, these rabbis, um, how did you overcome the classifications in the archives and the Yad Vashem photo, uh, photography archive? And um, what are some um, maybe skills that we can all uh, uh, gather to overcome this emotional toll that Professor Finder uh, referred to, right? Looking at these pictures constantly. And how did you, how did you go about all these challenges? Yes, so actually when you start your question, uh, the first thing that I thought to myself is, uh, knowing what horrible documentation you have to deal with, Jan, yeah. because uh, this is, I mean, the Holocaust in general, of course, is something so difficult to refer to, but uh, those uh, weeks and months of the uh, beginning of the uh, Barbarossa operation and this intimate brutality, uh, it's, it's really very, very difficult. And the only thing I can tell you is that uh, uh, I don't have any good advice about that, about the emotional uh, di uh, difficulties. But uh, I remember that when I was writing my PhD, uh, I, find my, I found myself uh, looking at those very difficult documentation and asking myself, how can we continue and do that? And then I went to, to seek advice with uh, some of my uh, teachers 
and Professor Gutmann, late Professor Gutmann was mentioned, and uh, Professor uh, Bauer was, uh, I should mention him. I remember I was knocking on the, I, I wanted to knock on Professor Gutmann's door. And I didn't because, you know, it's quite uh, embarrassing to ask a Holocaust survivor, well, you know, I have a difficult time to look at the pictures of what you and your family has passed through. So what can you tell me? So I couldn't really uh, ask him, but I did go to Professor Bauer. And I don't know if he remembers that conversation. And I came and I asked him, what, what, can, what, what can one do with that? And he said, well, you know, I never promised you a rose garden. Uh, but the only thing I can say is really the friendship, uh, the friendship of colleagues and uh, and uh, students and teachers, which all of us uh, face those very difficult uh, problems. He told me how he and Professor Gutmann are walking down Auschwitz and crying together about what the awful stuff that they deal with. And actually, this was the best advice I could get. Uh, because um, being uh, a historian, it always has some kind of a loneliness uh, experience. But uh, dealing with those very difficult uh, subjects, this loneliness becomes even the more difficult burdens. And I know that for me, there are better and worse times. And here I find my friends, my, my students are my friends as well. So they are very helpful as well. Discussing those issues, uh, and seeing how we can face them because it is very a, a, a very big problem. So I don't have again a good answer to this question. Regarding the the, the documentation itself, so the, the visual documentation, so I was quite lucky because dealing with Warsaw Ghetto, we has we have much more information. And my problem was many times that the same pe person was known by different people as there were a few, uh, a few different identifications. And I can presume that dealing with the stuff that you research, it becomes even more problematic because many times we don't know exactly who took the picture, uh, who exactly is being pictured there. And the one survivor that uh, is from that small community didn't remember or nobody asked him and so on. So we can do our best and try to find more. I can only recommend the wonderful research done lately by Tal Brutman and his friends regarding the Auschwitz album, who just showed us again how much is unknown, even regarding very well-known photos. And I'm sure that when we will read your research, we will learn about, not only about the historical context, but also about uh, those people that you could and couldn't identify. Both are important. Well, thank you for sharing all this. Javi, I would like to ask a question that uh, was sent from uh, different directions privately uh, about your take on the current state of Holocaust studies in Israel. Uh, so uh, I know that you uh, were part of a community of uh, the committee who wrote the report, the recent report for the Israeli Academy of science uh, on the teaching of the Shoah in Israel. And we would like uh, to hear your, uh, your take on this experience and on uh, the situation. Yes, so, so uh, I, I think we all uh, scholars in Israel have for years the impression that things are not uh, uh, as they were in the past in Israeli academy and that in the, in the past, the uh, Israel Academy stood in the forefront of research. Uh, this is not the situation today, and that there is a significant uh, reduction in the, sco the scope of Israeli research. And this brought to the establishment of this committee, and I was only part of it, it was uh, the other members were Professor Bauer and Professor Shlomo Avineri, and Professor Shula Volkov, and Professor Dina Porat, and it was head by Israel, Professor Israel Bartal. And we were trying to give a report of what is going on in different academic institutions in Israel, in universities, as well as in colleges. And what we were trying to do is, first of all, map the situation according to three dimension, and that is Holocaust research, what happened during those years. We also try to define what we call a, a historical context, uh, context, which is needed for Holocaust research and can, Holocaust research cannot be written without it. And that is a, 
uh, anti-Semitism and Nazism and World War II and the Jewish life before the war in many different contexts. And the third dimension that we referred to was a commemoration, a research of commemoration and, and memory. And what uh, we found out is that there is a, an increased interest in Israel research in commemoration and remembrance, and many times much less interest in Holocaust research. Um, and that is, I can say, the bad news. Uh, the, and the bad news are that we feel, and this is what we found in our uh, committee, that we don't even have one institution, academic institution in Israel, in which one can study the Holocaust as it should, with scholars that can guide him, referring to what happened in East uh, Europe, in Eastern part of Europe and in Western parts, in reference to different aspects of ideology and daily life. And actually what we need to help uh, develop young, uh, uh, excellent uh, doctoral students is that those students will hear different views because there is this phrase in Hebrew, the knife doesn't get sharp, don't get sharper if it doesn't find a different knife that can sharpen it. And today we don't have even one academic institution that one can study the whole context of the Holocaust, all the needed historical context, and learn about the commemoration aspects as well. So that is the bad news. The good news is I think what we have here as well. And that is that I think the promise is in the cooperation of those different institutions. And those institutions are universities. And unfortunately, uh, of the six universities that have, we have in Israel, uh, half of them don't have scholars that we have in all of the university, wonderful scholars, but scholars that research and write research about what happened to the Jews between 33 to 1945. We have half of the, of the universities that today we don't have a scholar who deals with those issues. And that means that he cannot guide other students and so on. The good news is that we have many other institutions as the Western Galil College and as and any, many other uh, um, institutions. And I think that the good news is that in a cooperation of uh, the different Israeli institutions, we can work together and help to grow a new generations of scholars that will be able to ask, to be critical to our own research and to ask more interesting questions and give uh, better answers to the, some of the fundamental questions that we're referring to. So this report mainly referred to the situation when we checked it, that was 2018. Um, there are many challenges for us as Israeli Academy. I don't think the question is this or that university. And I feel that uh, working together, and this is just one example. I referred before to something that was done by Lochme. Yad Vashem is doing wonderful things. Uh, the Western uh, Galil College is doing uh, excellent things uh, which are directly referring to scholarship. And I think that with cooperation, we can take this very challenging situation we are in today and try to do something better for the future. Thank you so much. And I think this is a, a very good transition uh, to uh, invite uh, Dr. Boaz Cohen, head of the, uh, the Holocaust Studies program at the Western Galilee College to conclude. And uh, thank you, Javi, for a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Gabi, and thank you, of course, Boaz and the whole staff of the Gabi. Thank you, Javi. Thank you, Boaz. Thank you all. Thank you, Javi and Gabi, and all the other people who made this happen. I think we had a wonderful experience we were looking, and this is something that we are working on from the beginning of the corona uh, era, uh, to have something that will stimulate, uh, will stimulate uh, researchers. And I think this conversation series is really doing this well. And thank you very much for this conversation.
I learned several things. I, I refer to two. One is uh, we talk a lot about Poland and the Holocaust in the sense of uh, memory wars. Uh, well, uh, something that Javi related to when she was asked about. But actually, when we look at what we learned from Javi, that there's a lot to the research of the Holocaust in uh, Poland that has to be done and is not now related directly to memory wars, like groups in a Jewish society that were left out in much of the, of the discussion, uh, the regular Jews who were not ideologically connected to other groups, what people were thinking. I think we are having a, a on the basis of the old research, we are getting a new research and new questions and new work for a, the next a generation of researchers. Indeed, uh, Javi mentioned the problem with the Israeli Academy. We in Western Galilee, we have a BA program of Holocaust studies where students do a quarter of their degree in Holocaust studies and we teach core Holocaust. I mean, uh, really the Holocaust itself, uh, although we are two of us are memory scholars, we teach very little memory and a lot of the Holocaust per se, World War II. Um, and we believe in what, what we don't have, we don't have an MA program and the research students and all the things that big universities should have. And I think this is really a challenge that we should answer. I want to relate to the discussion on the photographs because I think uh, what Javi did here was very daring. And uh, I would like to mention two points that lead me when I deal with this type of photographs. First, I don't show horror photographs in the classroom when I teach Holocaust. I use texts, I use uh, uh, anything, but I will, I hardly ever use a, uh, atrocity photographs in classroom. I think Israelis have a problem that they go to my students say got so much atrocity photographs from a young age so that this is actually causing some distance from the Holocaust. And they're like a friend of mine who grew in the, the USA in the 60s, she said, all those gory movies they showed us. So I don't show gory movies. I don't show bodies and bulldozers in Bergen Bells. And I, I, there are things I don't do as a teacher. And still, the subject matter is hard enough. The other thing I think is uh, the dignity of the victims. Uh, I think of these women that you showed and what they felt at that moment. And uh, this is why I think uh, photographs of nude uh, survivors, men or women, should not, uh, which is like the, the peak of their humiliation, should not be shown or should be shown. We have a lot of modern ways to show them, like pixeling. We can pixel a part of the photograph. I think uh, when you understand that these women standing in front of the pit naked because they had no child, these are women who never went around naked. The same in the movies from the Warsaw Ghetto, where women from the street are forced to go into mikves, etc. So I think uh, the ABC of ethics in using photographs, and you did it actually by hiding the women in your way, but if we do use such photographs, and if they are important, we can use pixeling. We have so, so many so that, models. You know, but you're, you're mentioning something that is very interesting because when we were discussing it, one of the ideas was to use uh, pixeling, but then it was seen as almost vadata tsniut. I don't know how to say it in English. Yes, I and, mean it was like uh, the modesty guard. Yes, and and but, and, but, that, and, but that's but that's a problem of secular Israeli society. I think a, a woman should not be shown naked, and uh, if not, it, I mean, against her will. So and so again. Th th this and if she's humiliated here, then you don't have to be religious to pixel her. You just have to say, you can explain in the text that you are respecting that woman. And I think we should respect also men who are undressed, who never went undressed. I, I agree, Boaz, but, but one student, and I still remember it when I was talking with my student before this book was published, was very angry. I think she's still angry to, until today that I didn't publish this picture. And she told me, well, you know, you are burying this woman in the archive. Nobody will see her face. 
Now, I had here two, 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 because on the one hand, of course you're right. I mean, how can I present this woman naked uh, without her permission, which we, we, we will never get and nobody would want even to think about it. But on the, on the other hand, I'm erasing her picture. So at the so bottom line- So her body parts and leave her face. This, I think we have a solution, which is not used in the Yad Vashem uh, Museum. But I think there is a solution. There are modern solutions how to pixel in an elegant way, in a respectful way. And you can explain that out of respect to the victims, you are pixeling. I think this is ABC uh, for me, of course. Now, uh, once I said what I had to say, I understand this was a really hard dile dilemma for you. I respect this. I will share a screen uh, with your permission. Uh, 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 we did a lot of uh, events until now, which were uh, 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 bringing scholars to give a full talk or a discussion. But we are now going to the next stage. We want people to, to do the coffee breaks of the conference now. And uh, we are having an event on the 26th of uh, August. Uh, the details are on the same place where you had the details for Harvey's talk. It is meant for researchers, that is people who do some sort of research, whether they are laymen, whether they are academics in uh, tenure, whether they are young, uh, young uh, 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 scholars, whether they are independent scholars. But if you have a research project, then this is for you. And also there is another, uh, prerequisite, you should be able to speak two minutes only about yourself and your work. If you can do a two minute presentation of who you are and what you are researching, this is for you. If you need 10 minutes, this is not for you. This is like we are uh, building it on the model of speed dating. We'll have a, a big Zoom room, a hall, and then we'll get out uh, randomly into breakout rooms. People will have two minutes to present themselves, five minutes to talk with one another, and then we go back and we do three rounds of this. The whole idea is to, to try and replicate this part of a conference of meeting new people, of meeting old friends, of uh, listening to what people are doing now, to have young and more veteran researchers have a chance to meet each other. So this is what we are trying to do. We'll probably have a lot of, uh, of uh, we have a lot of uh, technical challenges in doing this, but uh, if you think this is for you, then that at one point we'll have to stop the registration because we'll just not have enough place for everyone. This is a very touchy project. But uh, we are all invited. I think this is, uh, we are trying, like we did a conference, we did uh, the conversations, now we are trying to do the coffee break and then uh, networking in the halls, doing the rounds. So uh, you are all welcome for this and we hope to see you in this event if it is the right event for you. So thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Javi Dreyfus. Thank you to Professor Gabi Finder. Thank you, Ruoni, Daniela, and Jan, and all the Western Galilee team. And uh, we'll see you in our next events. And uh, be safe, be well, be healthy. And we hope to see you in person as soon as possible. So goodbye. Thank you, boss. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This is the part we like where we see all the faces disappearing like in Hogwarts. People just fly out of the, of the photo. Okay. And we apologize, bye bye. we apologize if we did not ask your questions. There were just not, in, there was just not enough time to ask everyone's questions, but the chat was there and everyone saw your, what you wrote. So uh, uh, your voice was heard even if it was not read. So goodbye all of you. Baltimore. <laughs> Nighty night. Bye.